so we see carried people in the audience as well. Um, I want to acknowledge our, our steering committee members who are here with us today. We've got uh, Larry Chang, who's our associate director, and Jonathan Weiner, who's a uh, member of our uh, steering committee. So welcome. Um, today we have with us uh, Neil Evans, who is the co-director of Connected Health and works at the Office of Information and Analytics with the Veterans Health Administration um, at the uh, VA. So it was, it's really amazing the stuff that the VA has, uh, has accomplished and really is leading the pack, I think, in, in testing and innovating in the, the mobile health and the e-health space. So um, having a, a vast captive po population with many needs that, that could potentially be met with, with new technologies um, is an opportunity they have not uh, let go by. Um, Anil is a board certified practicing uh, primary care internist at the, the DC uh, VA. Um, but he also started his career here at Hopkins, so we're glad to have you back in the, your uh, you know, home turf. Uh, and uh, he has also a, a BS in chemical engineering from the University of Delaware, so uh, bringing multi and transdisciplinary research into a, a single focus. So uh, we're glad to have you here and welcome. So Thanks. let's welcome Neil. All right. Well, I'm glad to be here. Um, we're going to talk today about uh, better engagement with electronic health technologies. And I know this is the um, Hopkins Global M Health Initiative. And I promise I'll get to M Health. We're going to start from a little bit of a higher level. We like to think of our um, patient facing electronic health technologies from sort of the more holistic level of connected health technologies. And then I'm going to dive more. Uh, deeply into M Health, but first, as Ellen just pointed out, I I did get my start here, and um, in case you're wondering, um, that's what it looked like. That was the first day of uh, medical school in Reed Hall. Um, this is back when I wore ties. I've since changed. Somewhere mid Hopkins career, the bow tie came in. Um, I, it's um, I'm not really sure about that. My choices in decor at the time. Nevertheless, that's uh, the Reed Hall dorm. And then uh, towards the end of medical school. I um, got to take the, at the end of medical school, you get to climb the dome there. We are climbing up the dome. It's me at the top of the dome with the, um, uh, with Dr. Victor McCusick, um, really a highlight of uh, my medical school career. And then I did residency here. It's not a Friday, so I couldn't wear the Osler tie. <laughs> I don't know it's against the rules, but I just, it's just to prove that I have the tie. There's a picture. Um, and I would say that this was in 2001 that I left uh, Hopkins, and um, now I'm back, a little bit less hair, um, and there's now a field called M Health that didn't exist in real, didn't exist in 2001 with any. Uh, there certainly would not have been this seminar talking about uh, M Health and, and patient engagement um, through these technologies. Um, I left here in 2001 and took a job with the VA and um, started out as a primary care provider and have um, since, um, and did some informatics training and I won't go through that whole story. Um, but what I wanted to do is today set the groundwork, just I think give you uh, some background on the VA. Some of you may not be familiar with uh, the VA patients that we take care of, the, sort of the big picture. And then we're gonna go through and, and talk about connected health um, technologies, our overall experience in using electronic health technologies to engage our patient population and to extend the reach of healthcare beyond the traditional face-to-face -face encounter. And then we're going to get into uh, our, some of our work in, in emerging work in the M Health space uh, more recently. So the VA, and this is the motto of the VA, this is from Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural address um, about a month before uh, he was assassinated. And in that address, he was talking about some of the healing our country needed um, after the Civil War, and, um, and towards the end of the speech, uh, included this, that it was the mission of our, uh, of our country, that we uh, had a responsibility as a nation to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan. And that has, um, uh, has been the mission and the motto of the, uh, of the Department of Veteran, uh, Veterans Affairs ever since. We're a rather large healthcare system, um, we have um, just over 9 million enrollees. There, there's somewhere between 22 and 23 million veterans in the, um, in the country, of, of which about 9 million uh, are enrolled with us. Um, and we're more than a healthcare, uh, uh, we, we provide more than healthcare. 
we provide insurance, disability, vocational rehab, et cetera. Um, but of, the, uh, of those nine million who were enrolled for us, we uh, take care of approximately, to the fact that about six million patients per year. And um, we do so at 151 medical centers across the country. The furthest away is in the Philippines. Um, the uh, closest is just across town here in uh, Baltimore. Um, and we have 985 community clinics, um, which gets us up to around 1,600 sites of care around the country. The VA in 1996 began a major trans, um, transition from a healthcare system that had had some, some problems. I'm not saying we don't have problems still, but uh, um, every, as I was talking to Adam here, you know, healthcare in America does, isn't. Anyway, whatever, we won't go on that tangent. The point is that we moved um, to, um, uh, we moved, we've transitioned freely from being a predominantly hospital-based uh, system to a health system. And um, as part of that transition, we divided up our, up our national system into 21 networks. Just to confuse people, there are 23 numbers up there, but that's because two networks combined and they couldn't agree on whether they could adopt the other person's numbers, so they took 23. So um, <laughs> the, um, um, there, there are 21 networks, and, we, and these really run as, um, as, as health systems where we try to provide integrated care. And, and part of this transition has really is what empowered the VA's ability to move so aggressively in forward in the connected health space in, in, in using technology to engage patients outside of the traditional face-to-face -face visit. And that was that we really view ourselves as being the healthcare provider for the patients that we take care of for their whole life experience, whether they're with us in their facility or whether they're not. And part of that is um, has to do with the fact that our um, patient population is, um, is of the around six million that we take care of, well over two and a half million of those live in rural areas. Many of them live two, three hour drive from the closest facility. There are places out there in the middle of Vision 19 that there's not many dots around them. Um, and many other places, Alaska, for example, um, huge um, area, a huge geographic area with a minimal um, brick and mortar presence for our healthcare system. Um, so we've had to think creatively about how do we deliver health care um, in um, and how do we extend the relationship with health care outside of the traditional face-to-face -face visit. And the other thing that has driven us is that um, our patients require um, and want a lot of communication from us and have complex disease. The average veteran who receives care in the VA has two additional med uh, medical diagnoses on their problem list compared to um, age and you know, matched individuals in the private sector and one extra mental health diagnosis. Um, so there is a lot to, to manage. We, um, the mission of the VA is to honor America's veterans by pro providing exceptional health care. VA has gotten a lot of recognition for doing just that, for delivering exceptional health care. Part of that has been um, because we have had um, access to data to drive performance from a very early uh, stage uh, in our journey over the last 20 years. Um, and that that care should be patient-centered, evidence-based, um, you know, based on uh, continuous improvement, focused on prevention and population health overall. Um, we, um, uh, these are our principles, and um, that patient care should be patient-centered, team-based, data-driven, and evidence-based, focused on prevention <coughs> and population health. That's a big one for us. We really feel that uh, healthcare doesn't start when patients present to us, but that we're responsible for the healthcare of America's veterans, period. Um, and that our, vet, our healthcare should provide value and be continuously improving. And this is where we get to our current priorities. And I put this slide up here, I stole this slide from the Under Secretary for Health for a reason. Um, because you can see there that connected healthcare is on the list of our top six priorities as an organization. Um, patient aligned care teams is VA speak for the patient centered medical home. So basically delivering comprehensive team-based care. Um, and um, connected healthcare, we're gonna talk about in a minute, is really how do we use technology to extend the re reach of healthcare. And then access, homelessness, mental health care, and standardization are, are other um, key priorities. And I would argue that um, in many ways, connected healthcare and our ability to deliver 
care um, out, uh, uh, through electronic technologies um, really actually informs, it helps the, the, our primary care teams to really do team-based population health type care. It, it improves access. Um, we have actually a lot of evidence that it actually does help us with reaching out uh, to the homeless um, and improve mental health care and has helped us standardize the experience for patients. So Connected Health uh, is, um, you know, we have a program office, a central office that I co-direct, and we're gonna talk briefly about that. Um, we define Connected Health as extending the reach of healthcare. This is just, I have every presentation should have at least one slide with way too many words on it, um, just to help you realize that the other slides were well constructed. <laughs> um, the, uh, and this is it. Um, so it defines extending the reach of healthcare, empowering patients and supporting healthcare teams through virtual systems of care. My definition, that's their official job of definition. It's powered, it's powered by consumer health technologies that engage patients and connect them to their health teams, enabling the extension of the healthcare relationship beyond traditional in-person synchronous encounters that for so long have been the centerpiece of patient-provider interactions. The key point is that connected health is about the relationship and empowering the relationship virtually outside of the traditional face-to-face -face encounters. And the technologies are just, in my mind, the backstory. Um, and we sometimes get a little bit too caught up in thinking about the technology itself and forgetting what we're trying to accomplish here. There is a, an emerging excitement, I think, about Connected Health and about M Health. There's a lot of people in this room, and that shows that. Um, and um, I think part of that was shown last month in February of uh, 2014 by the dedicated issue in Health Affairs on the early evidence and future promise of Connected Health. Definitely a worthwhile read. Um, if you haven't um, looked at that issue, uh, there's some interesting things um, in there about uh, mobile health as well. Um, an interesting article from Kaiser. I think Bill Frist's introductory uh, article is, is really outstanding and sums up um, a lot of what is driving uh, the trend um, towards connected health, not just in the VA, but in healthcare overall. Um, you know, Bill makes the point that uh, we really are at an exciting time where we have this, what he refers to as the magnificent advances in information technology that are occurring at the very same time that consumers are realizing that they can be empowered and engaged in their health care. And that that parallel trend is going to transform American health care. Um, he argues that actually we don't even need everybody to be an empowered consumer, just a small subset will start to drive the rest of healthcare to offer um, these um, services um, to reach out to patients um, and more meaningfully engage them in their daily lives. Um, connected Health, so in VA, we, um, so I just told you it's not about the technologies, and now I'm going to tell you about the technologies, but <laughs> it's okay. Um, the, uh, so VA um, has, um, we, we, uh, view, we have a sort of suite of technologies that we view as part of our Connected Health portfolio. And as I told you, I'm gonna start with the others because this is an M-Health talk and so you, you won't leave um, even though the pizza may be gone. So we have, um, uh, my health event is our personal health portal, uh, point of service kiosk, scan echo, mobile health, I'll talk about each of these programs. Um, we really are seeking to align these, although they're each individual technologies, you know, different platforms that patients are engaging with us, but seeking to align these so that the experience is unified. Um, this is a picture that is here just to show you that the VA has changed. Um, um, I, I, um, I, you know, this is what happens in the VA, and this is in my mind the transformation that's occurred really over the last 10 years, starting in 2002, 2003 in the VA. Um, by the year 2000, by the year like 19, I think it was by 2000, the VA had a single unified electronic health record across the entire organization. There was a computer in every exam room nationwide, 1,600 facilities. Um, but what has transformed even further is that we have here what is not an uncommon scenario in the VA. That is a patient who sent a secure message through our website to his provider saying, I have a lesion on my head, or I'd like you to vacuum my brain out, one of the two, <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure. Um, but in fact, he has a seborrheic keratosis that I'm concerned about. Um, and 
he could have taken a photo of that and attached it to the secure message, but he was worried enough about it that he wanted to come in. And so, but he lived, he lived two hours from where he sees his primary care provider at the main medical center. He went to a community clinic where we have a guy who didn't exist 10 years ago at the VA, the telehealth technician, who sets him up with his microscopic Lilliputian primary care provider, who was able to speak to him through a video visit and, and diagnose separated keratosis, reassure him he's back to work. The technology here is interesting. There's a lot of it, computer, telehealth device, brain vacuum cleaner slash dermatology camera, um, and you know webcam up there. But what is meaningful here is this, this, and this. It's the relationship that we have that allows for better care. Um, to give you a sense for the scope of what we've done in Connected Health, uh, we started again, I told you about 10 years ago, um, clinical video telehealth, which you saw an example of in that picture, started in 2002. Um, our personal health record, our web portal called My Healthy Vet, started in 2003. Um, this is the number of veterans that we've served in uh, 2013. We have just shy of 2.5 million active users of our personal health record. And I'll give you some more data on these telehealth programs and explain these in more detail. Um, but it's a rather um, extensive um, uh, collection. I would argue that many of these, particularly telehealth, um, have are no longer in the pilot stage in the VA. These have become this has become the way we do business in the organization. Um, our telehealth program is uh, recognized as an international leader, and this is uh, last year we provided telehealth at um, over 705 community clinics, 151. I can't do that now. I get 856 uh, sites of care last year. It's 608,000 uh, patients amounting to 1.7 million telehealth episodes of care. Those are reasonably big numbers. And when we talk about telehealth, we have three <coughs> programs in our telehealth uh, uh, portfolio in the VA. The first is a picture on the left. This is care coordination home telehealth. We have our teledermatology, teleradiology, tele-ICU, tele-everything um, um, programs that we'll get into in a minute. And then we have clinical video telehealth um, for uh, Counter. So we'll go through each of those. Clinical video telehealth provides real-time video consultations. We have 44 clinical specialties right now. It's really across the board, um, uh, including um, really the most notable that's emerging at the moment is telehealth care, but from, from patient-facing, quite a few. Most of these encounters occur at one of our community clinics and connect the patient to the specialist at the primary site. Um, but increasingly, we are transitioning, and our, one of our goals is to really move a lot of these, this video care onto people's <coughs> mobile devices and into the home through the web. Our home telehealth program allows us to um, um, collect uh, data from patients. Uh, every patient who's on a panel with home telehealth transmits through, um, for example, one of these devices in the home, and we're increasingly doing this through mobile um, apps as well, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, that data is transmitted at the moment to a care manager who partners with the primary care team or the specialist who referred them for that services. Uh, and we manage a host of um, conditions. The biggest are diabetes, heart failure, hypertension, obesity, head injury, depression, um, and we'll, we'll get into some of the outcomes in a minute. And then our store and forward technology, this is teledermatology, telewound care, et cetera. Uh, uh, probably our biggest um, um, is uh, teleretinal imaging uh, for diabetes, retina screening. We have a very um, um, extensive program in that. Um, Dr. Adam Darkins, who runs our telehealth program, has, uh, has done some uh, nice research into the outcomes of the program. Um, our home telehealth program, uh, in, uh, when studied in fiscal year 2012, which is basically 2012, uh, reduced bed days of care by 58% and hospital admissions by 38%. Now part of that is that the individuals who we choose for our, health, health, our, our home telehealth program are the majority of them, between 70 and 80% of them, fall into the category that we call non-institutional care. These are individuals where the primary care provider or the specialty provider, whomever has referred to them to the program, feels that they are at risk for 
being institutionalized in the near future. And so we're taking people with multi-system disease, lots of complicated problems, and we're um, putting them uh, in this program and to keep them in their home. And so it's not entirely surprising that when you choose a population that has multi-system disease and is rather ill, that, uh, that you're gonna reduce bed days of care and hospital admissions if you just actually look at the data that um, they're transmitting and, and increase the, the, the uh, opportunity to communicate with them. Um, clinical video telehealth um, in mental health care reduces bed days of care by 56%, which is pretty impressive. I would say in clinical video telehealth, mental health has been the place where we've seen the, 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 the biggest uh, um, success. Um, it, it, uh, yeah, we, our patients really still value their interactions with their psychiatrists. They still feel that it's warm and a meaningful um, uh, relationship that they can make progress and that they're able to access care closer to home a lot easier. They're more likely to seek care. We think that's part of what's leading to that. Very high patient satisfaction. The VA, for many of our patients, has to pay for uh, for travel costs when patients come into the facility. So for us, we can save quite a lot of money through um, um, have paying to send somebody to a local clinic as opposed to, to the main city, wherever that might be, where the closest big VA is. Um, and so that's why we see pretty significant cost savings for both um, video telehealth and store and forward telehealth. And our home telehealth savings, um, all, in 2012, same study here, was just shy of $2,000 um, per patient. I appreciate the fact that they published it as 1999. I have to imagine there may have been some, there was probably a standard deviation on that. They could have rounded it up to 2000 but now I have to always, when I present, say 1999 instead of 2000 um, our, per, our personal health record, our web portal, um, is my health event. Um, my health data again has more than 2.5 million active users um, and really um, we think of it uh, as as a tool to improve communication to help ease transactions it's really like refilling prescriptions to get access to your own personal health data your electronic health data which you can do through viewing your health information and also what we call the blue button which is a, something that you're probably familiar with started in the VA and now has spread well beyond the VA as a, a way to download your own health data. Um, my health event started in 2002 predominantly as a website that was, you know, we were delivering trusted patient information. Back in 2001, everyone was scared that if you, you know, Google something, you would find you know, craziness. And so we as the VA thought that we should provide a repository of, of trusted, vetted health information for veterans. But what really has driven uptake and use of my health event is not health information, it's not trusted health information, it's these pieces, it's the, we'll get to them in a minute, it's the expert care, it's the easy transactions, it's better communication, and health and self-management. Um, we have, um, again, over uh, 2.5 million registered users, 47.3 um, million VA prescription refills since August 2005, um, <coughs> rather, rather significant engagement with the platform. Um, the, uh, and these are just some, some screenshots of what it looks like. Um, prescription refills are, are by far the veterans' top request for what they want to use um, initially. Basically, that's what gets people onto the platform. You make it easy for them to do transactions, and suddenly then they say, oh, now I can write to my doctor, or I can view my health information. Um, the blue button um, lets you download information. You can download a, an extract. Um, in various forms, uh, a CCD document, there's lots of ways we can do this, but uh, we have now released online to veterans, essentially their entire chart. Notes, um, so their progress notes, labs, um, uh, pharmacy data, essentially anything that I can see in the electronic health record, uh, they can see um, on my healthy bed or through their blue button download. We've, um, deployed secure messaging across the entire enterprise. Every primary care provider and mental health provider has a secure messaging account and is communicating with their patients uh, through electron electronically. This is a is one of the number one requested features as well on our mobile platform, not surprisingly. We view this as a core part of our mental health um, platform, which 
gets us to mobile, um, which we're going to talk about in more detail. Um, we really have only started the mobile journey more recently because, uh, because there has, wasn't really a, a lot of room to move. We really started in 2011, um, but in earnest in 2012 in developing applications. And I'm going to talk a little bit about our strategy there, but first I want to talk about the other two pieces of our connected health puzzle. Uh, point of service kiosks, you know, one of the things um, we know is, is that 65% uh, of our patients who receive care from us have access to the internet. Um, but that means that there's a significant percentage who don't. And um, the 35% who don't, we view point of service kiosks as an opportunity to give them the same experience and the ability to interact with their data when they come to our facility. If you've ever been to the VA, um, the VA is equal part healthcare facility and social club in some ways, right? If you come to the atrium of, of a VA, it's a, it's a, it's a good experience. Uh, they're, they're, there's lots of reasons to come to the VA, and if we can, you know, while we have you captive in the, in the atrium, uh, um, engage you, that we can feel that that's use, useful. Our Scan Echo program um, started out in New Mexico, um, was based on Project Echo, which started at the University of New Mexico. Um, we basically are leveraging the, the large video network that we've stood up as part of our video telehealth program um, to empower um, primary care providers in remote areas to feel, to have a, a community. So one of the things, I just wandered across campus because I parked at the outpatient center so I, I could reminisce about my days at, uh, at Hopkins and walked across here. What, what I, what my, the overwhelming sense as I walked across campus was, one of the things that's really great about this place is the community and the fact that you you know you can always find someone else who has an expertise that's interesting to you. Um, but when you're in the middle of a community clinic out in rural New Mexico, you can feel very isolated as a as a healthcare professional. And so, um, what we with the Scan Echo program, we we now um, we take we take care of 1,600 patients per year, but. Really what happens is we do case presentations from one of the remote CBOX um, via a video call. And the specialist, who is the Scan Echo, Echo expert, essentially uses that as a teaching opportunity to empower the rest of the watching primary care clinics around the country to better manage <coughs> the, these complicated health issues. So for example, hepatitis C um, uh, is, was where this all took off. There were essentially primary care providers weren't quite sure what to do with hepatitis C, and they were referring everyone to Albuquerque to get the consult um, to say, should we treat you for hepatitis C? And it was mostly just that they, they, they didn't have a chance to go to conferences, they're working, they're, they're quite busy. So with Scan Echo, you would come and present that patient, and it's significantly decreased the referral rates, improved patient satisfaction, Specialists feel much better that they're um, they're um, also getting consults that make sense when somebody's driven three hours. A specialist doesn't like having somebody show up in their clinic and say, "We really need to come." Um, so that's really the summary of our um, overall um, connected health um, journey. Um, we um, this is a slide which I'm not going to go through in detail because I want to get to the in health portion of this. Um, but, but really what we're trying to do, is, these are our strategic goals of where we're going, is, is to view these technologies, mobile, our web technologies, et cetera, as an integrated platform to engage patients across the spectrum of healthcare and to assure that for veterans it's easy for them to access, that they have the appropriate tools and support to use it, and uh, that it is an increasingly personalized experience for them. So let's talk about our mobile program, and we'll dive in there. So, I, I um, there is, is there interest in M Health these days? Well, the answer is certainly yes. You came, and perhaps just for the pizza, but uh, you seem to have come for other reasons. And if 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 we wanted to, we could spend our entire life going to um, to conferences about M Health or sitting on conference calls about M Health. Um, I just threw this in here, just, you know, there you are. <laughs> that in there last night? Um, you're not part of the slide. Um, and I would argue that there is excitement about M-Health and there's the danger of getting too much hype about M-Health if we're not careful and we don't study it and understand how to apply it. 
And the same would occur with what I'm about to show you. This is an article um, from Modern Healthcare six months ago. It says three days ago, but that's because I got the screen cap six months ago. Um, the VA has long been a national leader in health IT. While it's not the first out of the starting block in mobile technology, it should be worth watching to see how the VA executes its mobile strategy in 2013. I plan to keep an eye on them, and you should too. But that makes me nervous, because that to me says it's a little bit too much hype. So, um, so, so just because, so I don't, so I, I would argue that, although that uh, it's nice of Joe Khan to say that, um, I think that we really are in mobile early in this learning journey of how do we actually deploy and, and effectively use mobile to engage patients. Um, this would not be a talk about health without the slide, so I've put it in there and I've seen it um, lots of cell phones out there. Um, our goals are uh, to focus on health by engaging patients and caregivers. I mean, we, so at the, at the big level, VA level, um, we, from the, from the national level, um, M health is a pretty broad field of how can we change healthcare in the VA. And we've said that these are really the areas we want to focus on initially. Um, engage patients outside of traditional healthcare visits, improve data sharing, and also increase healthcare team proficiency and, uh, efficiency and satisfaction, because we recognize that if M health interventions are gonna work, it's partly that it's empowering the relationship, and I'm gonna to get to, to that in a minute. All right. Our first dip into the pool of M Health uh, was through an application called the PTSD Coach, which was developed uh, by the um, National Center for uh, PTSD. Um, this is a collaborative project uh, between the Department of Defense and, and the VA, and has um, received several awards. It's been really um, uh, um, well received and gets a lot of use, well rated on the App Store, et cetera, and is used by not just veterans, but by um, non-veterans. A great app, um, we're a big fan of it. It's uh, a core part of our portfolio. Um, this, is a, this is one of a now host of mental health apps that have been developed by that same team. Um, and um, these are all standalone applications. They are essentially coaching applications, health coaching applications to um, um, to, to basically engage patients in between visits, smoking cessation application, parenting tips, concussion coach, um, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, so uh, there's, a, there's a suite of these. None of these connect to our back end system. They're all standalone. Um, I think these are important, um, an important uh, part of our portfolio. At the, at the national level, the program that I'm overseeing, um, we um, have also felt like that, that what is also important are applications, and the harder work is sometimes is developing an application that integrates with the electronic health record with our backend system. And so we started in 2011 um, with a pilot to take data from Vista, and this is definitely demo data from some um, from a developer because there's no physiologic lab testing things <laughs> like that. But nevertheless, um, we we created a mobile application um, to bring data from uh, from the uh, electronic health record uh, in front of clinicians on a mobile platform. And there was a, you know, what we found is there was a huge desire for, for, for this kind of tool. Um, but when you deliver a, an electronic health record app that only has 20% of the data or 30% of the data, it's not good enough. You really need the full set of data. Um, but, but the fact that we were able to do this securely and, and work through a lot of the, the struggles of getting mobile devices deployed within the VA, there's some, several issues we had to work through, um, gave us a lot of optimism. And we've since divided our work into three uh, work streams. The first is the, essentially the infrastructure to support, uh, to support a robust mobile deployment, both patient-facing and, and healthcare team-facing. Um, the second is veteran-facing mobile applications, and then provider or staff-facing mobile applications. And, um, I'll take you through some of our work in that area. We um, um, took our these are our uh, these are our, basically our systems in the back end. This is all of our Vista systems at the medical centers, our corporate data warehouse, etc. And those communicate with um, the mobile applications environment. In particular, what we call the health adapter. And so all of the data is pulled from our back end systems to the health adapter and exposed to the mobile devices. No data 
resides on the mobile device of its personal health information. It's all hosted in uh, the Verizon Terramark Cloud, which if you're wondering what the cloud looks like, it's a field somewhere in the middle of Virginia with a couple buildings in it um, up there, right. So um, in addition, we um, have been working very hard in the last years to create within the mobile applications environment a common development space, building the tools uh, within uh, the base of building tools so that they can be reused to create mobile apps um, by developers outside the VA as well as by innovators within the VA and have created a certification process uh, including branding and assuring security, privacy, etc. for any application that then gets published to a commercial app store. Um, and we can talk about that if you're interested. We are doing most of our internal development as HTML5 applications um, that we then phone gap if we need to, to use them on a specific platform. Um, we found that for us so far that's been the preferred approach. I think the jury is still out on that from a long-term perspective for organizations, but that's what we've chosen to do. Um, so I'm gonna take you through a little brief tour of our healthcare team-facing apps and then our veteran-facing apps, including some data from a recent pilot that we've done uh, with family caregivers. Um, and that I think you'll find very interesting and then we'll sum up and take some questions. Um, so on the healthcare team facing app, I think I thought this information was interesting. Um, this is not VA, this is in a, outside of VA. 83% of the clinicians would immediately use a mobile electronic health record app to basically do their work, but only 8% currently have that available as of last year to the, through their electronic health record vendor. So the ability to, to, to have the full EHR experience on mobile isn't really there yet. Um, we are uh, working to develop a suite of applications. This is what we call our launch pad. Um, and these are the applications we currently have developed. I'll talk you through those in a minute. But uh, the big one is the patient viewer application, which at the moment is our developing, uh, it's essentially our attempt to create a, a, a mobile version of our electronic health record. We've been able to expose all of the data at this point in time, so you can see all the data from the record. We can now write progress notes back to the record, and we're working on the ordering functionality at the moment. This is the suite of applications that we're developing. Uh, the patient viewer app, again, is the electronic health record. And then we've really tried to focus on um, use cases where, um, where staff ha have been frustrated with having to sort of jury rig the current EHR to fit a specific workflow. So for an example, it, it's our immunization app. We give at a typical facility at the, the DCVA, we'll give 30,000 flu vaccines in the atrium over the course of two months. And to do that requires three laptop computers. We have to network and get them all set up so that we can register the patient, give them the vaccine information seed, record the vaccine. And so this application allows us to, with a single application, do everything. Register, take care of the billing, the, the, the workload, we don't have to bill. Uh, record the appropriate lot of the vaccine, email the patient their vaccine information sheet that's required, take care of the whole package as one application. Similar with warfarin monitoring and some of these others um, that are meant to, to make things just a little bit more efficient for the healthcare team. Um, to support this, I know this has been done here at Hopkins. Um, we're in the midst of a major deployment at 18 medical centers. We're deploying um, mobile devices, uh, or predominantly at this point in time, I've had minis to uh, all of the professional staff um, for use um, both in and outside of the hospital that will be running these applications. This is just last week, the distribution at uh, Washington, D.C. Um, a lot of excitement about uh, using mobile. And we hope that uh, this will serve as a sort of an innovation, uh, as, as a sort of a kickstart to innovation in the mobile space. We have a little more experience um, on the veteran facing side. Um, this is data from the Health Information National Trends Survey. Um, we were able to add two questions to this survey. Are you a veteran and do you receive care in the VA? And those two questions have now allowed us to get a sense for um, technology use um, within veterans. 92% of veterans have a working cell phone in their family, 91%, I'm sorry, I'll, 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 I'll orient you. Non-veterans are the red bar. Veterans who don't receive care from us are the green bar. The blue bar are those who actually receive care from us. Um, and I'll just, um, I should pause here. Uh, at the moment, uh, Congress has restricted eligibility to VA care um, to, um, 
because we're a bureaucracy, we've got to have you know rules. Category one to eight veteran, one to seven veterans. Category eight veterans don't currently uh, qualify for care. So um, I'll explain what that means. If you're service connected, if you have a disability that uh, uh, developed as, as part of your service in the military, um, uh, you're automatically eligible. If your income is less than $27,000 per year, you're automatically eligible. If you were in the system before the restriction, you're automatically eligible. But if you don't have a disability, a pre-existing disability, and your income is above $27,000 per year, and you're a single person, you're not currently eligible. So we're pre-selecting for the disabled and and um, those with a lower uh, income, the lower, lower socioeconomic status. And as a result of that, the penetration of technology on top of that, still the bulk of our patient population is from the Vietnam era and World War II era. Um, many of the veterans who served in Iraq and Afghanistan would serve multiple tours, so the number of veterans who enroll with us is fewer people than in uh, Vietnam and World War II when you were drafted and you would serve a single tour and you'd be out, so that, that there's a, a large number. So they're, they're, they're older, sicker, and lower socioeconomic status. On average, VA patients who receive care from us, the blue, compared to those who don't receive care from us. And you can see that in the, in the penetration of uh, technology. 65% um, uh, of our patients have access to the internet. I think this is the more telling figure. 21% um, of, uh, this is essentially smartphone or tablet use having access to our cellular network. 21% um, of our patients have access to mobile phones that can access the internet, a smartphone, versus at the time it was 40%. These numbers have both gone up. We are waiting on the 2013 data. What's interesting to me is, is that um, when we ask the question, have you downloaded health-related information to your phone, 10% of our patients, so 50% of those who have a smartphone have done so as opposed to only 25% of non-veterans. And so, and that may be that they, that our patients have more health problems and so they're more likely to download um, information to their phone. But even though we don't have a, we don't have as rapid an uptick of adoption of the technology, we, we think that we have interest and engagement uh, from those patients. And I'll talk about um, our strategy also to, to try to avoid creating a digital divide in a minute. Um, what really informs us is what do veterans want. These are the results uh, boiled down of the Voice of the Veterans Survey. These were hundreds of focus groups run all across the country asking veterans, what do you really want from healthcare? And we use this to drive our decisions of what to, what to, what apps to create in, in the mobile space. Um, these things all make sense, I think, to most of us as to what we would want out of our own healthcare. Um, but sometimes having that focus is helpful. And when we boil it down, we really feel that in the mobile space, um, these are the four categories that we need to focus on at the national strategic level. We think there's a lot of room for innovation and local and health initiatives, and we encourage that within the organization. But if we're developing and supporting apps at the national level, these are the big, the big buckets. The apps that, that provide expert care or enable self-care for veterans, those that enable information sharing, we would view that in both directions, patients generating their data and sending it to us, us sharing data from the electronic health record with them, applications that ease transactions, and applications that open lines of communication, whether that be video or electronic, like secure messaging. These are the four space buckets. And um, our current uh, portfolio of applications includes that whole suite of mental health self-care apps, which is a critical part of them, um, and then these following apps, that, which I talked about earlier, and then these that are in pilot testing, We'll go through, I'm going to talk about this family caregiver suite of apps in more detail, and a few of these. And then three that we're soon to release nationwide, summary of care, which is access to your electronic health record data, mobile blue button, which is the mobile form of the blue button on the website, and the launch pad, which is envisioned as an application that will then provide a referral mechanism for other mobile apps to veterans as they move forward. Um, we'll talk uh, briefly about the family caregiver mobile health pilot. This uh, started, um, in um, August of 2012, I should provide some background. We have a program at the VA called uh, the Family Caregiver Program. It's a program where um, if, uh, if, if somebody was seriously injured in Iraq or Afghanistan in the post-9-11 conflicts, um, they and the person who is, who is caring for them can apply to the VA for a stipend to help manage their care at home, to help them continue to thrive at home and not require 
institutional care. These are mostly veterans with pretty severe traumatic brain injury, um, severe skeletal injuries, or other problems from the service. And we um, wondered, could mobile applications um, and mobile devices improve lessen caregiver strain and improve the quality of care for veterans participating in this program. And at the time, in August of 2012, there were just around 4,000 caregivers registered in the program. We sent a letter to them as evidence, uh, basically saying we'd like to send you a free iPad for a year um, with a suite of 10 mobile applications on it to help manage your health care. Um, do you want to participate? And we got 1,200 yeses back, which does say something about caregiver strain when the offer for the free iPad comes. Um, there's enough people who are feeling strained that they don't see the letter, or who knows why. But we heard back from 1,200. In the end, some of these dropped out or had moved or got, moved out of the program. In the end, we distributed just over 800 iPads. Um, and those were distributed in May of 2013. Um, the iPads had a suite of uh, this is the highlight of the applications. Um, all of these applications had connections back to the VA. Pain Coach is a coaching application, but also the surveys uh, and the, the screening instruments that are used in that application are shared with the, the care provider on the VA side. An app designed specifically to reduce, reduce caregiver strain for the caregiver of the veteran. The journal app, which is a, essentially patient-generated data, they could record their vitals and transmit them to us and other things you see here prescription refills, the ability to see your data from your electronic health record, there's the famous spell of correct, it always happens with the HR. Uh, PTSD management, the health advocate, this allows the veteran to say my spouse or whoever my caregiver is can see my health information, that um, is essentially all that does. And then notifications, the ability to set reminders to take medications, as well as our ability to push um, notifications to veterans on their mobile app. <coughs> Um, these are what the apps look like. They use um, the uh, we, they use the VS logon credentials, which I'll get to in a minute. It's an important lesson learned from our pilot. Um, there's a launch pad that includes a reference to all of the mobile applications that uh, they can use. You can see the PTSD coach, the health assessment, care for caregiver app. Um, this is what the summary of care app looks like. Allows them to see that same demo data with rapid fluctuations and RBC count. Um, the, journal, I'm joking, the, the journal application, this is where they can enter their information, transmit that to us and keep track of their own information. The prescription refill application, where they get a list of their medications and can click refill um, to get that medication. Uh, we supported caregivers with training through a quick start guide, videos, a, a help desk that uh, um, it was available for them in regular newsletters, which I think is important as when we talk about some lessons learned. And we've um, we really had three evaluation studies built around um, around uh, this um, intervention. The first is uh, a product, the primary quasi experimental study, where we've been um, looking at caregiver burden rates. We um, in this program. In the program, if you enroll in the family caregiver program, on paper you had to take the Zara caregiver burden score um, on a regular basis to stay enrolled in the program, and we're now able to deliver that screening instrument through the mobile application, and so we can keep track of um, the uh, the levels of uh, caregiver strain in the in the intervention population, and we also are able to look at changes in healthcare utilization in those who have the applications versus those who don't. We are simultaneously doing a longitudinal cohort study where we're looking at um, matched groups of those who received the intervention the applications and the iPads, those who didn't, and looking at outcomes that we're able to measure from the electronic health record. And then also using data from the electronic health record and data that they've shared with us to see if we can predict who is more likely to use mobile applications uh, along these uh, that are that are those in this kind of a suite. And then we're at the end of the study, which is coming up in about three months, I'm going to be doing phone interviews with the high and low app users to get a, a qualitative sense for what worked, what didn't work, why did you use the applications, why didn't you use the applications. And I have uh, some of the um, preliminary data. This is where in the middle, of, we're in, starting to analyze it. This is not finalized data. In the end, we distributed 879 iPads, the average age, um, of both caregivers and veterans is 40. 95% of the caregivers were female. 90% of the caregivers were spouses of veterans. 
Um, and the majority of the veterans were service, had a service-connected disability of 80% or greater, primarily from PTSD, fractures, uh, or traumatic brain injury. 60% of them were in a rural, uh, urban area and 40% in a rural area. And this is the baseline caregiver strain scores for the population. I don't have uh, any of the subsequent data. We're still collecting and analyzing that. But you can see that there were reasonably high strain scores in uh, the population. This is all 879 participants. And what we see uh, from early use of the applications is that um, the primary applications used were the notifications, the ability to set reminders to take my medications and about my appointments, summary of care to see my data, and prescription refills were the predominantly uh, used apps. 72% of participants in the pilot had used at least one of the apps uh, in the suite. And um, the adoption in the early months was as we would expect, fairly rapid adoption as we mailed the iPads, which we mailed from June into July, and a little bit of a drop off from we're right now analyzing the subsequent data. When we look at those who didn't use it, that uh, the 30% the who didn't use the app, the predominantly reason was that we had trouble with the login. And this is a, unfortunately, we, the, cred well, the credentials that we're using are, defend are administered by the Department of Defense, and we are the Department of Veterans Affairs. And there are all kinds of rules about how you get in-person proofs to prove that you are who you are and get a premium DS logon credential. And it's proven to be a big barrier. Uh, to entry into the platform is the authentication piece. Um, and then, you know, app issues and usability are the other two big things, and that's one of the reasons we were doing the pilot, is really to try to understand a little bit more about how to design these apps from a usability perspective. Um, I mentioned that the study where we're doing analysis to try to predict who uses the applications, here's some of the preliminary data. As age increases, app use decreases. The odds of use increase if a caregiver is a spouse of the veteran. Um, the odds of use increases if the, so versus a non-spouse. If the veteran lives in a rural location, and the odds of use increase if the veteran has a mental health diagnosis. We, um, we, th these are statistically significant, but we're still working on getting uh, some of the final data because the pilot's still running for another three months, so uh, these are not certainly not finalized. Um, because we're getting close to the hour, I'm going to skip through some of these. These are just the other apps that we're about to release. And um, come here to the end here and talk about uh, a couple of our plans for mobile applications. These are the ones we currently have in the development queue. The first one's the one I'm the most excited about. This is a program that's modeled uh, based on a program that we have a partnership with uh, NHS England. Um, and they have a program that they have deployed throughout NHS England called Flow for Florence Nightingale. Um, it's a two-way text messaging coaching system. And Flow, in her inimitable British way, texts you in the morning and says, morning, Flow, have you checked your blood pressure yet? And you send it back to me and provides coaching um, on a host of like 70 different protocols. It's used in mental health you know, across, across the board. Um, and it's been very successful. Um, the, we are adopting that and, and customizing it for the VA. We renamed it Annie because we're on this side of the pond. Um, <laughs> Annie G. Fox was the uh, first woman to receive the Purple Heart. She was the chief nurse at Pearl Harbor. And um, when the attack on Pearl Harbor occurred, so our text messaging program uh, will be Annie and we're excited to see um, how that uh, progresses as we're currently developing right now. I can talk more about that with QA if you're interested. Um, we're, we're taking a dive into trying a, a gamification app, what we're calling Mission Health. This is uh, an app to encourage patients to set smart goals to improve their health and pits veterans based on their original service uh, against each other, so Army versus Navy versus Air Force versus Marines versus Coast Guard. Um, to try to improve health care. And we're actually working on a partnership with the Veterans Canteen Service for awards for participation in the Mission Health app, um, and also in our Wellness Check Biosurveillance app, um, and a free cup of coffee at the canteen the next time you're at the VA to try to encourage engagement with those applications and, and several others. Our website is listed here if you're interested, and we try to keep that up to date with all the apps that we're working on. So to sum up, I wanted to talk about <coughs> couple of the lessons that we've learned. 
Um, these are uh, these are the lessons in particular with regard to um, veteran facing apps, and then I'm going to talk about sort of the bigger lessons about care at a distance, connected health, and then we're done. So barriers uh, to use low computer literacy and access problems and credentials. These with our mobile apps and veteran sites have been our two biggest um, problems. What facilitators to use? It's been we've realized that it's been absolutely critical to have telephone support. Interface design is critical. And this has also been a big lesson that uh, if a trusted healthcare provider invites you to participate on the platform, you're far more likely to engage. So it's that trusted invitation to participate that brings people in, keeps them engaged with our veteran uh, facing apps we found. For connected health overall, I would say the biggest lessons we've learned are that senior leadership commitment to care at a distance is absolutely critical. You, you, it's it, for an organization of our size. Size is a significant investment to invest in a portfolio of technologies, including telehealth and the personal health record, et cetera. And that really requires a, a high level of commitment from senior leadership. But the devil is in the details of how you design and implement these applications uh, across the board, whether that be a telehealth intervention, the website, et cetera. Um, and that um, those that succeed are those that uh, you're more likely to succeed if you've done good user-centered design, if you've made systems easy to use, and if you've thought about both the provider and the patient workflow carefully, uh, informed by, by pilots, and that you're doing an agile uh, development process where you're actually you know, learning from the lessons from prior mistakes. Um, the, again, this effective communication to patients is absolutely critical um, for my healthy vet, for example. Um, if the primary care provider says, I want you to participate in my health event and use your messaging, patients are far, 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 far more likely to do so. And once they do so, they stay engaged. But it's that initial invitation. When we ask patients what matters here, what matters again is not the technology that states that I know that my healthcare team is on the back end of this that's empowering uh, the relationship. Um, and again, that we need to provide good user support and a low barrier to entry. Um, so, my contact information is there, again, our websites, and I'm happy to take some questions. Uh, great stuff. And so my question is not at all meant to, because you can only do so much at one time, but it's amazing the progress you guys are making. The, the one thing that I didn't hear about, <laughs> which um, maybe is built in, but a lot of communication back and forth from patients to physicians. <clears throat> um, arguably, one of the big problems in healthcare is the lack of communication from clinician to clinician. And maybe that's not as much of a problem in the VA, but integrating the various people involved in the care of the patient, um, in addition to having good data to work with, is arguably two of the big problems. You've got the information. So I'm just wondering about the coordination. Is that you know, is that not a problem in the VA, or are you trying to find ways? By the way, I love the fact that all of your technology is all about making the communication better and connecting people, because there's so much e-health technology out there that's driving people apart and trying to replace people with machines, so that's great. But I'm just curious about that integration of healthcare aspect. Right, I think it's a, it's a very good question. I think the Scan Echo program is an example of one where we were where we're trying to connect to providers. Absolutely. You know, for the most part of the VA, we don't have as much trouble with that internal communication about managing um, care because our providers are, with rare exceptions, all under the same roof. So if I need, I know at the DCVA every psychiatrist in the psychiatry group, every cardiologist, etc., because I've been practicing with the same group of the same constrained group of specialists slash primary care providers. We're, we're really an accountable care organization who is, you know, we're, we're all under one roof. All of my patients get referred to the same specialist. And, so you, it, and we all sit at the same noon conference together. It's a little bit of a smaller operation than, than So communicating, by the way, what drug you have them on is gonna mess with my beta blocker. Or I'm worried about if you start this drug. I mean, that communication goes on. It all happens either through the electronic health record, uh, there's the means to do it through the electronic health record, or through various curbsides. One of the other program that I didn't mention, that we, we it's a big program in the VA, and it's sort of 
we don't consider part of connected health, but it's, I would argue that it's, to answer your question, it's the e-consult program. So we, within our electronic health record, we have decoupled the need for face-to-face -face care. So, so uh, also to decrease the need for patients to come in for consults where it really was just the need for a, a, a curbside opinion from a, a provider. So across all specialties, um, except electronic consults where I can, so if I'm a new provider who doesn't have 13 years of experience, who, know, who doesn't know who to go to to talk to about my cardiology problem, I can put in a cardiology e-consult and within a day I get a nuanced answer from the cardiologist in the chart. And it's recorded as a, as a you know, it's, it's, it's flagged as this is a chart review, um, but based on this, here's my official opinion. So we consider that a, you know, a real consultation. Part of that, we can do that because we don't care about the billing. I agree. I was actually really interested in sort of the attrition that you see. I saw a little bit in your graph, but in general, with technology in general and apps in general, there's a lot of insights at the beginning, and then we see a lot of drop off. And how do you keep people engaged? And how do you re engage people in care if there's something, um, you know, that's something that's necessary that they're going to in care? So I'm just wondering what do you guys engage you with that? Right. So. We, so I, I don't think we know enough in the mobile space to say what's going to happen. We, we're, we're, we've committed to developing a lot of mobile applications, but I, we, I worry a little bit about that attrition question. Um, we definitely saw um, some attrition in the mobile caregiver pilot. One of the reasons why I didn't show you the rest of that chart is that somewhere in the middle of the pilot, Apple decided to push iOS 7, and even though we had told our uh, pilot users with 17 emails, a newsletter, and personal phone calls, do not upgrade to iOS 7 because you will break the VA app. <coughs> and, you know, this is our device that we're letting you use and go ahead and continue to watch all the Netflix you want and do whatever you want, but don't go to iOS 7. And 40% uh, of our patients upgraded to iOS 7 um, and broke the apps. And so it really is, it's created, it's been hard for us to measure that attrition because we, we saw this huge drop of use and it's because, you know, it's not because they weren't desiring to use it. Um, I think that the, our experience with uh, with the personal health record has been more instructive there, and that is that without the connection on the back end, you see rapid attrition, but it's when I can get something done that I need to get done, like talk to my doctor or the nurse who's supporting him, make an appointment, get my prescription refills, or find out what my lab results are, that you don't see the attrition, because that is stuff that people find valuable. And I think a lot of the attrition in the mobile space is that people are creating apps that, are, that don't really make a difference in what healthcare is all about, which is a relationship. 